Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at MORTEC with Steve Crosher, who's going to talk today about how to monitor the dynamic conditions on a chip. So Steve, things are getting much more complicated as we move down to 7 and 5 nanometers, but the tolerance, tolerances also for some of the physical effects that we've been measuring in the past are much tighter than they were um, at the older nodes. What has to happen? How do you manage to track all that, and what do you have to do? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. So what we see is as we uh, descend through the uh, nodes, say from 16 to uh, 12 to 7 to 5 nanometer, etc., is that we start to see that gate density um, with that sort of descent through the nodes uh, really starts to have an effect on uh, uh, many areas of the dynamic conditions on the chip. So uh, quite often there's uh, more hot spots, they're more localised, there's a bit of uh, variation on supplies and also you have the challenge of uh, process variability across the device as well. So in order to measure this you really have to figure out where you're going to do this, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, where you're going to try and monitor these dynamic conditions and these variances in the process. And of course, you know, there's that uh, law or rule that always says whenever you try to monitor something, you're displacing some of that inherent information on what you're trying to measure in the first place. So why don't you draw this out for us? Yeah, absolutely. So Steve, what are we looking at here? Uh, yeah, so what I've drawn here is a, a typical kind of arrangement for a, an AI chip. Um, obviously, they vary uh, tremendously in scale um, compared to, you know, if you're looking at either a data center type AI chip compared to something that's maybe more on the edge, maybe an automotive, for example. But yeah, it's a general structure of a multi-core uh, architecture. The difference on an AI chip, though, is that a lot of these are always on and you're moving data through at very high speed. So monitoring things like uh, temperature differences across the chip matter a lot more than they would on, say, a, a smaller device where it's on and off. Uh, yeah, the conditions are, are much more extreme. And uh, one of the things we find is that uh, you may have a multi-CPU, uh, multi-core architecture and it can consist of hundreds or maybe hundreds of thousands of cores. Uh, but what tends to happen is that um, the workloads are very bursty as they run the algorithms and as they execute on the compute. Uh, so what we see is that there's often a case where you cannot quite deliver enough power uh, to have all cores operating at once. So you never reach 100% utilization. So what we're talking about is you have to make the most of the power that you can deliver to the device. And to some extent, this is load balancing across a chip that has to happen, right? And it has to happen dynamically. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, so those considerations as well, because um, if you start to uh, have a, an uneven balance of load and workload across the cores, uh, that can, of course, uh, cause stress to areas of the chip where they're overworking, uh, mainly due to the heat that's generated uh, through certain regions of the chip being uh, uh, overactive. So given all of this, what do you have to think about when you're placing these monitors in the chip to figure out where's the heat going, what's happening, where's, the, where's vibration and things like that? Yeah, well, um, first of all, uh, it's to try and consider that you are working with uh, repeated structures, so uh, multi-cores may be grouped within clusters. So uh, what you tend to see is the monitors are placed uh, per cluster, but then the placement of those monitors is repeated along with the clusters. So it becomes quite uniform, um, and that also makes it easier for the design teams and the guys doing the floor planning uh, to handle the, 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 the repetitive nature of placing the monitors. So what do you have to keep in mind? Uh, because sometimes as these things heat up, the, the, because of the conductivity of the silicon, it actually, the, the heat actually drifts across the chip too, right? Uh, yes, that, that, that's true. After uh, an amount of time, there will be uh, a thermal dissipation and a thermal flow through the silicon. And after all, the silicon uh, device itself and the dye itself is very thin, so that, that inevitably does happen. But we also see anecdotally uh, from the custom base that we have is that you can actually get hot spots uh, that are maybe 20 to 30 degrees higher than other areas of the chip, uh, which is quite significant. And you have to be very, very accurate now because you are dealing with very tight margins on where you actually place this, right? 
Yeah, yeah. There's um, uh, obviously it's very desirable to have the entire dye uh, being monitored thermally, um, but of course there is an overhead to any sensor that you put into the chip. You know, so you have to be able to distribute it carefully, um, and uh, you know, in some sort of um, granular way. But you have to accept that um, there will be distances between where the actual hotspot lies within the chip and maybe a particular core that's uh, being overworked compared to where the sensor is actually placed. So there can be a little bit of correlation required between that hotspot and where the, where the sensor is. So taking a look at the drawing that you've got there, where do you, how do you know where to place that sensor to make sure that you're getting an accurate reading? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's uh, another good question. So there's a few tools that can be used as part of the development flow uh, and basically good practice. So there's a lot of uh, thermal uh, analysis tools out there that for different uh, workloads and different uh, software and different activity profiles that have been run over the chip, you can start to see where the hotspots are. That can give you some general guidance as to where to place the, uh, the thermal sensors. Um, also, uh, it can often be uh, down to the, the, the floor planning and where there's available space, but quite often we recommend that you do place the sensors as close to the, the cores and the highest density grouping of cores um, as possible. So let's dig down into this a little bit. What have you actually drawn here? Yeah, okay, so if we start at the, the, the very basic element, so uh, we have a core uh, and it's being repeated, uh, so a grouping of the cores then is a cluster, and then we can repeat that cluster structure. Um, it is interesting that we're seeing, depending on the application, uh, hundreds of cores, or even as we've recently seen uh, in the press, uh, devices that are up to 400,000 cores, which is just a, a phenomenal thing. So yeah, I have a, an arrangement of cores and a sort of typical looking um, sort of AI structure uh, that you might see. Is this going to be the same regardless of whether it's a, a classic uh, von Neumann architecture or whether it's a neural net of some sort? Uh, from our experience, and this is just from our experience, it does tend to be uh, cores and, and repeated structures that we see. And uh, probably one of the things I should mention is that um, uh, the very nature of the compute that's performed on the, the, the AI network is that it's quite bursty in nature. Um, it's not necessarily always on, it's, it reaches peak demands and so then you have to deal with uh, thermal conditions uh, being accelerated going quite high over very short periods of time. Do you also need to, to place monitors inside the memory as well is, uh, because that's affected by um, thermal gradients also too, right? Uh, yes, so uh, depending on the memory type that can be quite uh, useful to do. Um, there is a certain degradation um, of use uh, with certain memories, particularly if there are uh, elevated temperatures. So yes, we do see uh, placement of uh, monitors within uh, the memory uh, space quite often. So where do people typically go wrong when they're working with this kind of technology? Yeah, that's a, so what tends to go wrong is if you are not planning up front uh, where to be placing these monitors, there can be a little bit of an afterthought in the floor plan, okay, there's a space, we'll just put it here. And that goes back to my earlier point, that if you're just filling a space with a monitor, uh, the correlation between what that monitor's seeing compared to the actual event, if it's supply or if it's a, a thermal event on the chip, the, the distance between the two can be quite great. Uh, so you're not getting the best reading, the most true reading. So it's for uh, thought, it's for planning, and it's maybe using some of these uh, uh, simulation tools to, to help you in that design flow. You're monitoring in context of real world use, but that real world use also can change too, right? So use cases vary, they may take the same equipment and say, oh, we're going to use it for a different purpose, and it may run completely differently. Uh, yes, yes. So. Um, the interesting thing about AI architectures is that uh, you have uh, those that are uh, developed and designed, large scale designs for essentially uh, data center environments. Uh, so the scaling of the chips can be quite uh, large going to maybe reticle size and maybe drawing uh, hundreds of watts of power. On the other side, uh, 
uh, you can, as we've seen more recently, uh, putting AI on the edge and the way it's being applied to automotive. So you're getting server grade uh, systems being placed actually within the car themselves. And obviously they have to downscale that and they also have to think about the longevity of the devices more, you know, reaching 10, 15, maybe even 20 year lifetimes within an automotive context, whereas within a data center, you know, the equipment, the, the technology may only last for maybe three years, four years, something like that. Is there any correlation between the heat signature, for example, that's coming out of a chip in a uh, car on, on day one as soon as it rolls out the door versus 10 years later after it's been used or when, if it's been used for uh, ride sharing, uh, you're going to rack up the miles a lot faster? As that starts degrading, will you see that in the temperature? Uh, that, that, that is possible, yes. And uh, what you might see there is uh, you can potentially see an elevation in temperature over time, a kind of a drift upward um, as some of the structures start to uh, gradually break down. Um, one of the interesting areas is more process. So uh, when we first started the whole uh, monitoring um, uh, project within, within more tech, uh, we often thought that process monitors would just be used at one single point only at uh, test time. Um, but what we're seeing is that the use of those uh, process monitors through the lifetime of the, of the product can tell you if there's any drift on performance and hence you can see if there's degradation and then you can see whether there's degradation to such an extent that you then need to start looking at swapping equipment out and as I say for automotive um, that's quite a key uh, aspect to, to consider. What do you have to think about in terms of the, the power supply here? Yes, so uh, if you have AI devices within a data center context, um, and hence the device is quite large, um, there is of course uh, the supply level that's at the input pin uh, may not be at the same level in the center of the chip. Uh, so you do have that IR drop effect. And so trying to monitor that is, is quite an interesting area. Yeah. Any dynamic issues regarding IR drop? Uh, yes, and, and this is uh, especially uh, relevant to uh, the AI application and the AI architectures that we see in that because of the bursty nature that the cores are being utilised, you can then get uh, um, uh, high demand quite quickly, uh, inrush of current into the device and then uh, a pulling down on the supply, so we see a droop on the supply. And that can be quite important to, to monitor and try and capture so that you can compensate for that with some of the, uh, the, the voltage regulators that are supplying the chip in the first place. So now you're looking at both the longevity of the chip as well as how well it functions throughout its lifetime on a very detailed basis. Yes, absolutely. So we do categorize it into two areas. So there's the monitoring for the dynamic condi conditions, the live conditions that sort of depend on what sort of activity profiles are on the, on the device. And then there's those kind of static, how the chip is made uh, conditions, those sort of process, uh, sort of built-in conditions as well that, are, that also um, are relevant to be monitored. Steve Crusher, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Thank you.